Good evening. Welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 2nd of November. <clears throat> and uh, today we've got for our first topic, um, we'll save our minutes for later. We've got our leg local legislators. We've got Joe Comerford on there. And is, I can't, I'm just trying to scroll down. Is Natalie on there? Yep. I can't see her camera, but she's probably got her audio on there. <clears throat> And uh, we'd like to invite you guys in for a legislative update, which will be greatly appreciated. I know there's uh, quite a lot going on, especially today. So, <clears throat> and um, why don't we turn it over to you, Joe, first, since I can see you first in my uh, little view there. So how's that? That's totally great. Um, and thank you so much uh, to all of you for your service, for giving me the chance to come and say hello and offer this update. Um, and I just want to say at the top, I'm really so grateful to Natalie for her partnership and our work together on behalf of uh, Sunderland. Uh, but really, I want to come and just double down on what I said initially, which is thank you. Governing at the local level, uh, having to do everything with municipalities and schools is just so difficult in normal times. And these are not normal times with the pandemic and with the economic crisis. And it's just so hard. And what I think about every day is how do I make your jobs a little bit easier? How do I work in partnership with Natalie on behalf of the community to help us weather this? Uh, so as you said, there's a lot going on. Um, I know Natalie will wanna add a, a, an enormous amount. So I'll just say that today the governor issued new COVID-19 guidance. Um, in the Senate, I chaired the COVID-19 working group and I was in touch with the governor and the secretary actually, Secretary Sutters earlier in the day because we've conveyed to her uh, from the Senate concerns about rising numbers and certainly we passed what is a sobering milestone in the 10,000 uh, deaths uh, since the onset of COVID in March. And we believed we had to do more. Uh, so the governor did issue um, this uh, new set of advisories which help tighten, I will say, some of the guidance I do believe and have been very vocal with uh, Rep. Lay and our uh, colleagues in the House that we have to do more to strengthen local public health. We have to do more to get testing, uh, a free accessible rapid testing site in Hampshire and Franklin counties. We have to do more uh, to strengthen municipalities ability to weather this. So um, we'll keep pushing, but today's announcement I welcomed uh, in the legislature You'll also see that things are beginning to become more publicly evident. We have a lot of work to do, uh, a lot of work to do before the end of the year. You'll, you'll have seen the fact that we voted, both chambers voted to go in formal session. In normal second years of a two-year session, you'd see us working what's called informally. We're not going to do that though, and we shouldn't. And I know uh, Rep. Lay believed this as well, and I certainly was vocal on it. We need to be in formal session because we didn't finish the people's business. And there are numbers of conference committees that are outstanding with pieces of work that are very, very important to our region. Um, there's a transportation bond bill, for example, and that will have a study that, that Natalie and I worked for that will look at the intersection between PVTA and FRTA. It also has uh, a provision um, that actually crosswalks or better crosswalks, culverts and small bridges. And then of course it has a lot of um, uh, money in there dedicated to regional rail and regional bus transportation and beyond. There's an economic development bond bill, which uh, is increase increasingly important as we try to weather uh, what's happening with COVID. There's a climate bond bill and many constituents and municipalities are talking about the climate bond bill because we're seeing here in the region um, just this summer with the drought, uh, with changing weather conditions, how important it is that we put climate first. There's a healthcare, develop a healthcare bill that's getting reconciled and that's going to have things around scope of practice, which will allow us to expand our healthcare force in Western Massachusetts, which will be essential. Also things there about telemedicine um, there's, of course, a budget to pass, uh, and we have to pass the fiscal year 21 budget, which we've only meted out in increments. And that's important for a number of reasons, having to do with uh, everything from rural aid 
to the 21st Century Education Fund, which we fought for last year, uh, which our schools hopefully will be entitled to and beyond. Um, so we need to continue to work to pass that budget and make it as regionally equitable as we possibly can. Um, I'll just turn to one thing, which is a bill I filed uh, and then I certainly wanna hear from Natalie and I'm happy to have your questions, uh, which is a bill I filed uh, called SAFE 2.0. SAFE 2.0 builds on what was a public health bill um, that came out of the Joint Committee on Public Health that I chair on the Senate side, went to the governor, uh, passed both branches and then went to the governor for sig uh, signature. That actually has already begun to help strengthen, especially in Western Massachusetts, our local public health, but it's just the beginning. Um, that safe 1.0, uh, strengthening local local public health. We have now filed a safe 2.0, um, which is actually really finally uh, a bill that will help re-envision local public health, local and regional public health in the Commonwealth for generations to come. That has a hearing on Friday uh, in the Public Health Committee. Um, so I'll both have a bill and then be chairing that hearing. I think it's an essential bill, especially as we turn toward uh, the fall and the winter and brace for another spike in COVID cases and tr do our best to make sure that spike isn't as, uh, doesn't bring with it as much hardship as the spring did. So certainly I'd love your uh, feedback as constituents and then also um, anybody's testimony who's listening. Uh, and with that, I'll just stop and certainly add or answer questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. Anybody have any specific questions uh, for Joe at all, or? Not at this there's, point. There's, there's so much going on right now, so it's it's a. Uh, I'm sure you guys give it. I heard go night. Busy. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yes, and especially when tomorrow rolls around too. I suppose. It is yeah. true. Yep. We're on Thank the eve of something quite powerful. Yeah. And, and I think everybody's just waiting around too to see how all the budget pans out and everything. That'll be that'll be important to see too and the effects of that this year. So right. So we're you know we're we're hoping for a level funded or just a bit better in the budget. Um, but some, here's something to know, which is the stakes of the election are so high because we will dip into the rainy day fund, but we can only do that once, right? You can only spend a dollar one time. Right. Uh, so whatever we spend in 21, and I do believe we need public investment to make to meet this crisis. I, I'm, I believe in that and I'm, I certainly am locking arms with Rep Lay in that, um, but we do need the federal government's continued stimulus yeah, for so every, from municipalities to higher ed and beyond. Hopefully no matter what happens tomorrow, they'll uh, get to back to work on a, a relief bill of some kind. So <clears throat> Natalie, how are you? I'm good, it's nice to see you all. Mm -hmm. I hope that one day we'll be back all together. <laughs> yes. Yep. Well, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. It is great to see you. And, and thank you for your leadership uh, in the town of Sunderland. It is so um, heartening to have such consistent leadership, uh, particularly during these difficult times. So I wanted to, to thank you for that. And, and like you, I think Senator Comerford and I are, are really focused in on the constituent services piece that has um, really shown the need for good government and for, for public servants to be here to answer the call. Uh, as you heard during town meeting, we are fielding calls from more constituents than ever before who are really in dire straits. Um, the highest number of calls that the office is getting is, is on unemployment at 100%. Yeah. And um, there doesn't really seem to be an end in sight. And so if there's one thing that, that I can, a message that I can deliver here, and I know that Joe, Joe places an equally high priority on good constituent mm -hmm. services is that if you need help, please don't hesitate to reach out to our offices. Um, and we are willing and we're here to connect anyone, any constituent with the services that they might need to help them get through these really difficult times. And that offer certainly stands for all of our communities as well. And it's been a pleasure to work alongside you all and with Jeff as we've tried to uh, address the challenges that we have faced as a result of COVID-19. As Joe mentioned, uh, there 
there are a number of conference committees that are still meeting and we're just starting to see an uptick in, in the action in the house. Uh, the, the house is scheduled to possibly meet as early as this Thursday. Uh, so we're really anticipating an uptick in the time that we are spending in informal and we will have formal sessions, I'm sure, going forward. The one bill that's in conference committee that I think is of particular importance to rural communities is the EcoDev bill. Uh, we were able to, on the House side, get in the Office of Rural Policy, which has been a priority for the Rural Policy Advisory Commission for years. We were able to advance the Rural Jobs Act, which Steve Kulik also worked on and Senator Hines has been working on. It's our hope to be able to kick both of those out. It's gonna, it's a real uphill battle, um, but we're, we're gonna keep pushing for those. Um, something that's been really important for our farmers is to allow for hemp to be cultivated on APR land. Senator Cumberford has been a huge proponent on the Senate side for this language. Um, healthy soils is another one that, that she pushed on the Senate side. The, the EcoDev bill also included uh, a large chunk of money for something called rural and small town grants. And the Senate was able to, to bump that up uh, significantly. And we wanna see that Senate number stay in. Uh, we know that our small towns really don't get their fair shake at uh, MassWorks uh, grants. We do see those strap grants, but this would really be a boost uh, to small towns to be able to tackle some of those infrastructure programs that uh, infrastructure projects that, that may have stalled out as a result of not having enough funding. And then on the budget piece, I want to, the way that it's worked so far on the House side is we all met with the chair of Ways and Means as, as divisions. So the way that we're voting is by subdivisions of our divisions. So it's smaller groups um, of about 15 people. And so we were able to sit down with the chair of Ways and Means about two weeks ago to talk about the FY21 budget. And I just wanna let you know, one of the messages that came out of that meeting from all of us was the need to ensure that we protect chapter 70 funding and the, and the UGA funding for our communities so that you knew in FY21 that that promise was going to be kept and that you had that certainty that that money would be there. The FY22 budget will be following shortly behind and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. <laughs> um, I think it's, it, it's going to be worse than FY21. And we'll have some difficult decisions to make in terms of the rainy day fund, in terms of raising revenue uh, and possibly in terms of, of budget cuts. Um, but certainly top of mind for, for me is ensuring that we maintain the services that people need the most uh, that we're doing our very best to to level fund our communities and make sure that that you know and you have certainty about the funding that's coming your way so that you can best serve your community uh, going forward. So um, Sorry about that. with that, I will wrap up and certainly turn it over to you for any questions. Does anybody have any questions for um, Natalie or Joe at all? I don't think we've got a lot of folks on tonight to care directly. Jeff, yes. Not so much a question, but mm -hmm. uh, if you are getting uh, inquiries from Sunderland residents um, about unemployment that are having trouble paying rent, uh, our CPA committee did um, grant oh. $50,000 and we're working with the uh, um, Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority to issue that they do have to be income eligible and, and there's some other um, prerequisites, but uh, if that could be of help, I just want to make sure you're aware, both aware of that resource too. That's Thanks, incredible. Jeff. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to echo what Natalie was saying about the just the huge onslaught of constituent uh, difficulties and cases. It's just extraordinary, and it's we don't see an end to it. Um, so just the, the the that wonderful action goes will go a huge way especially in light of the eviction moratorium ending. And we've got their contact information on our website, right, Jeff? So that uh, folks can contact them if they don't know where to go, they can go onto our website and get that information. The redevelopment authorities information? No, for Natalie and Joe, sorry. 
Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. I, that's, I just want to make sure the folks know that. So. Thank you. <clears throat> the other thing that we've been doing is we've been watchdogging the governor's plan. Uh, hmm. So, you know, the governor rolled out what is quite a sweeping plan. And many pieces actually are quite good. They're just not, they're not there yet uh, in terms of the capacity of the state to respond. And so one of the things that we've had to do is um, continue to have meetings with the administration, with the judiciary, which we just had on the Senate side. I know that Replay is doing that on the House side with colleagues um, to really both understand the plan so that we can interact with it, but then also really practice uh, holding the, the administration accountable. You know, if we say that we need ra a raft turnaround, which is, you know, the rental program, rental assistance program uh, for small landlords or renters, if we need that in three weeks, but we're still uh, closing a backlog from the summer, well, then that's not real enough for our constituents and our municipalities. If we say 211's the number, the portal that everybody can go through, but in fact, you don't get a call back from 211 for 36 hours and it comes at 10 o'clock at night. Well, that's not real either. Um, so we have to make it real. And, and I'm hoping actually that we find a way to legislate some support for small landlords and renters to bridge uh, this plan, um, lest we really see considerable hardship um, for individuals and small landlords across the Commonwealth. Uh, I think, I think it's if, a, I, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, is that a function of the capacity of the state because of its agility or is it demand or a combination thereof? Really good question. Um, no, it's actually, I, honestly, I, you know, I think RAFT, the program um, at RAFT uh, it, that, that DHCD has administered and um, has been, you know, it's, the setup has been arcane. I think I'll just speak candidly. Got it. Sure. You know, um, there was a time not so long ago that in Western Massachusetts, you had to go to an office to fill out a form. Right. Um, so they're, they're advancing with, I think, all due haste. You know, we spoke to Wayfinders, you know, that's the, that's the raft agency administrator in our area, and they're just taking leaps forward. Um, but it's not, it's not, we don't have enough time. They don't have enough time. We haven't given them that time in the governor's plan. So it's a little bit of magical thinking. Um, right, because they have to go from paper copies to seeing an uptick that they've never seen before and administering millions of dollars at the same time and staffing up right. during a pandemic. Um, and so All very it, challenging. It's super challenging. Um, and we, we, the governor would like us to believe, I say this respectfully, you know, that he's got it covered, his people have got it covered. But the truth is that they just in human terms haven't yet worked out all the kinks. So they're making the road while they're, you know, they're sprinting along it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's just, it's undoable. And I, you know, so I, you know, respectfully think uh, both the, the legislature needs to take uh, greater responsibility. And I'll just say that. Um, and we have to hold the administration and the courts accountable. Great point. I think I unfortunately, no, you go ahead. No, please Andy, right. go ahead. I was just going to comment that most of the, the burden is falling on the states at this point right now anyway, because we're not getting, you know, a lot of um, assistance from Washington at the moment. So it puts even more emphasis on what we're trying to do here. So, yeah, in many ways, we need to be self-supportive, um, yeah. waiting, waiting for Washington to act with some sense of direction is a fool's game yeah. these days. <laughs> exactly. So that's, so that, that, that said, I want to thank, uh, <laughs> Uh, both Joe and, and Rep Blay for coming tonight. And uh, I wanted to ask two questions. The first was how much, if any, of politicking is going on with the revenue forecast, or is it just that volatile? Sometimes there is, there is positioning between executive and legislative and ways and means and Senate. And, you know, how is it this year? It's, it's never lockstep, but, you know, is it grounded in reality is my first question. Sometimes it depends on uh, which chamber you ask. Well, I hear that's what, that's what we got. We got two out of three. Yeah. Yeah, let's see what, if Natalie agrees. Um, from from my perspective on the Senate side, listening to our chair of Ways and Means, I feel like there's been some very good faith yeah. communication between the House and the Senate yeah. um, through this fiscal year 21 budget. I hope it continues through 22, right? Because mm -hmm. that's how we work out here in Western Mass, right? We consider ourselves allies. Sometimes, as you know, it doesn't happen like that in Boston. 
um, I do believe they are tasked with an unbelievably difficult yeah. uh, job to figure out how the heck to chart revenue as you know the economy uh, expands and contracts and COVID numbers spike and you know governor's orders um, come on a daily basis and our schools don't have a, a bright path toward reopening and child care issues. You know, I could we could go on and enumerate all of the variables that they're looking at as they chart the budget. But I I think it's I think they've done the right thing by gathering the best minds across the political spectrum, which I think is also important um, to make the forecasts. Where I don't think there is general agreement is on what we're going to do. And um, Replay was right to point to this regarding revenue. We're going to need to talk about raising money in the Commonwealth uh, because we will not have enough in 22. And so I don't know that there is a unity of mind yet. Um, you know, in terms of leadership, uh, in terms of what's the fairest way to do that, uh, you know, and I think about that as fair in terms of more of a progressive revenue um, footing, but then also fair in terms of regional equity. Yeah, I 100% agree with Joe. I mean, they had the economic, the second economic development roundtable a few weeks ago and, and took testimony for hours. And there did seem to be consensus at the end of that, that meeting also seemed to be consensus about how much we we're willing to take out of the rainy day fund mm -hmm. and recognizing that there are repercussions for how much you take out in terms of bond ratings and, and how much is there for future usage. Um, but the revenue, the revenue piece is going to be a challenging conversation. And um, like Joe, I am pushing for that progressive revenue that would hopefully, you know, shore us up and make sure that we are able to fund those programs uh, that are really helping those most in need and that uh, our towns are, are able to have, have the funding that you need to serve our residents. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And my follow-up is really, really simple. How was the freshman term? Was it as much, was it as much fun as you both anticipated? I was thinking about that. You guys got thrown right into the frying pan. <laughs> you great, it's been great. I like to remind Steve Kulik, and Steve, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> you picked a hell of a time to retire. <laughs> so it's been, you know, it took, we were both in for a year and sort of, and learned the process, and then COVID hit, and we had to learn a completely uh, new way of doing business. So I think the, based on the what we've been exposed, uh, experiencing with both of your offices, staff, as well as individually, uh, you know, it's been nothing but exemplary. So I want to thank you both for your service as well. Well, I would agree. It's lovely um, of you to offer that. I'm, I am really grateful to uh, my team. And I know Natalie and Lily are gorgeous. And let me just say that electing Natalie Blay <laughs> was one of the best things that the first Franklin has ever done. Um, couldn't ask for a better fighter in the house, more strategic, more brilliant, um, you know, more goodwilled and tenacious. And we laugh as much as we hunker down, which I think is gonna get us through. Um, and there's so much trust between our offices and so much partnership. Uh, it, it does make, it does give me a lot of hope for making it through COVID and then getting to really have that second year of a second term right. <laughs> kind of getting to bring it home in a way, right? We were, I thought we were on a very good track um, for that first year. Uh, and as Natalie said, we hit COVID and, you know, we had to, we have to learn a whole new thing and do it. Right. And, and as we should, right. That's what we were elected to do. Um, right. But there is some disappointment. I will just share candidly that we were, we're not going to be able to bring home as much as we had hoped. Um, in, at the end of the first year, but that's not going to keep us from going back to the second year um, or second term and trying it again. So, can I just add one thing? Um, I want to sing Joe's kudos as well. Most recently, for bringing everyone to the Sunderland boat launch. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we Joe led this amazing kayaking trip down the Connecticut River and. I met her at the Sunderland Public Library parking lot and we joined, <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. We joined partners from all across the Commonwealth. And what I heard along the way was how they are using 
Sunderland as an example for the Commonwealth in terms of how you have redeveloped the boat launch, how you've, rede you've worked the, the walking path. And so I just wanna make sure, you know, Jeff was there and he heard it, but Sunderland's really making its mark as a town that's doing it right. And I wanted to just let you know that and thank Joe for allowing us to shine a spotlight on. Oh Amazing. yeah, I mean, it was one of the proudest moments, I think, <laughs> was gathering in the library parking lot and then walking down and hearing people go, oh my God, oh, is that a trail? Does that go along here? You know, all that wonderful um, exuberance from the advocates and from actually state officials. Oh, that's wonderful. Here. And it's Natalie, nice. thank you for hosting. Natalie went above and beyond. Yeah, we appreciate that. Unfortunately, I was not able to make that, but it, uh, I think it's important to have because a lot of communities are right on the river and yet they don't have a good connection to it. And I think that's that's an important thing for a whole lot of reasons, especially with eco tourism. And you want to talk about economic development. That's a big, um, a big piece of it. So it's fantastic. Thank you. And we appreciate you guys coming here tonight to give us an update. It's always important, especially under uh, the current times and everything. And we really appreciate your uh, your work and your effort, and and uh, and also we uh, I think we definitely appreciate the voice that we have there with you guys representing us. So we'll Thank make it you. a point to reach out oh, a couple times a year, not not to not to yeah. be a burden, but a couple times a year to check in to see what we can do and uh, how we can continue to work together. So. Thanks, Scott. It's a Great. joy, um, and never hesitate. Right. Um, we, we should be there for you every time you need to tackle something at the state level. So every grant letter, every grant inquiry, <laughs> every ad piece of advocacy on the part of Sunderland, you, you know, I, I want to lock arms with Natalie and do it. That's, that's really reassuring. I appreciate it deeply. Thank you. Thank all you right, all. any questions from, from, from our folks who are there, John or Aaron or Lori or? Public Library, FCAT, anybody? If not, it's headed off to the quiet. It's headed, headed off to the archives, and you have to drum it up and look at it. You can yell, you can't yell at a tape. That's right. I didn't have yeah any question. I just had some notes in the chat, though. So that's all right. Yeah, yeah I saw John, those. John, I saw Great. those. Thank you Thanks, so John. much. Future resident, always appreciate. Good to see the uh, representation. All right. Thanks. Super. Well, Terrific. Thanks very much. Take the rest of the night off. <laughs> <laughs> At least Thank from this call. You anyway, all. Right? <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. All right. That was a good update. <clears throat> that was a good update. And hopefully next time we'll have, it'll be under slightly better circumstances. <clears throat> well, there all is right. something to be said, David. There is something truly to be said about, you know, being um, in uh, the throws in having to be creative uh, and there that is. also you know is is um, a, a sign of skill set and character and all those things you know i think that's that's just just wonderful the response that our our delegation has had and uh, the work that they continue to do for for their entire entire uh, districts i would agree you, you learn a lot more in harder times uh than you do when things are going nice and easy and everything. I remember my first term on here was uh, when we hit that budget wall. Yeah. So, and that's, you learn a lot more that way. I will yep. say that. Great point. That's true. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is like fading out tonight. Um, next up, we've got our minutes from October 26th. Uh, move to approve. Okay. <clears throat> All right. All those in favor of the minutes from October 26th. Hi. As you just point out, uh, for those viewers, we are down one individual tonight. So <clears throat> it's just Scott and I tonight. We're going to close some roads and do other fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, let's see. So next up on our agenda, we've got um, our library reopening by appointment only topic tonight. And we've got Catherine Hand, our fabulous library Catherine. director there. How are you? Hi, thank you. How are you all? All Good. right. Thanks for coming tonight. And oh, thank um, you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, to describe your wonderful program that you're working on. So Yeah, so we're hoping that we can reopen the library by appointment for two days a week. Um, the idea is that we would start on Tuesday, November 10th, provided we have the approval of the Board of Health and the Select Board. 
Um, browsing appointments would be available on Tuesdays from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. and on Saturdays from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, patrons would make appointments in advance by contacting the library or we also have an online system called Calendly that could be used to, to set up appointments from online at home. Um, and the browsing appointments would be private. So it would be one group gets a 30 minute appointment to, to use the library and the groups are limited to members of the same household. So we're really hoping to kind of keep things as you know, safe and private for people as possible. Um, and we would allow 30 minutes in between appointments for staff to reset, clean the building and you know, make sure we're ready for the next group to come in. Um, people would be able to use computers during, during their appointments if they would like to. Um, and we would just, you know, ask that patrons who do come in for the appointments um, self screen before they come in. Um, they have a, um, their face covered uh, mouth and nose at all times when in the building. Um, we can provide masks if folks don't have them themselves. Um, and just ask that they follow some basic sanitation um, requirements that we have in order to keep things um, safe for everyone. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Catherine on, um, on the program? Catherine, what's the pent up demand like? You know, I think it's, it's been pretty mild, I would say. There's certain patrons who really want to come in and browse for materials. Mm -hmm. yep. That is families um, where they're, they want their kids to be able to come in and pick up books. And, and also, they're, you know, they're studying topics at school. They want right. to you know, be able to get in there and actually see what they, they have. Plus there's, a, there's adults too, and that, that's just how they, they use the library. That's how they discover books and they, they wanna come in and see what we have. Um, but there's a lot of patrons who are very happy with the curbside services that we're offering. Um, and I've, I've heard from, there's a lot of libraries in the area locally that are, have reopened um, you know, with similar styles by appointment. Um, and they're saying the same thing that there's certain patrons who really wanna do it and a lot of patrons who don't. So it, it hasn't been like people knocking on the doors, too many people right. requesting appointments. It's been very manageable, which I, you know, is really heartening to hear. That's good. But, um, you know, patrons who do um, take advantage of this service really appreciate it, um, but it's not absolutely everyone really feels the need to, to use it. So it, it is manageable for staff. And we would sort of continue to offer our curbside and remote services while we're offering appointments as well. Do you want to take the opportunity just to remind folks about that, just in case they don't know, it might be a good idea, sort of a little PSA Absolutely. for you there. Yeah, so we are, the library, um, even though we're close to the public right now, we're still working our full hours. We're there 40 hours a week um, plus working um, and we're providing curbside pickup, um, which means you can request an item either from our library or from the CWMRS network. Um, and we will put it outside for you to pick up. Um, so you don't have to come into the library. You can call in advance or you can place your, um, your hold online. Um, and both ways work and we're happy to make selections for you. We have a lot of people who say, I want 10 picture books or I like mystery books and we'll, we'll make the selections and other people um, are requesting specific titles. Um, we're also offering 30 minute computer appointments right now um, for folks who do need to come in and use a computer. Um, although Wi Fi is available in our back air, backyard outside the library in the parking lot, too. Okay. Sort of a little drive by hotspot there for folks. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and we will do printing too. If you don't want to come in, you can always email us documents to be printed and we will leave them outside curbside as well. Oh, that's good. That's good for folks to know, especially if we start going into a little bit more of a lockdown. You know, Netflix yes. is only going to get you so far. So I think it's good that they've got uh, some other options. Yeah, and I, I will say that the plan I've, uh, you know, submitted is, you know, fluid. <laughs> um, if things change, we will have to take a step back. Um, but I do feel the way that we've presented it right now, it does seem like it, it's manageable and it's as safe as it possibly can be. Um, but no matter what, we will always offer the curbside and remote services for pe people who are not able to come into the building. Oh, that's great. We appreciate that. And just a reminder of folks, of course, books don't require batteries or software updates. So we've got a lot rec to recommend them still. <clears throat> uh, David, having read the plan, uh, is, is, Catherine, are you looking for a recommendation from the board as well as uh, Board of Health? Yes, I was hoping you guys would would let me know your comfort level with it. Okay. And if you have any suggestions for how we can improve it to make it safer. 
I think ha having having read the plan prior to the meeting, I'm, I'm all all uh, for endorsing that and make a motion to approve and uh, contingent on the Board of Health's review and approval to the library to keep doing the great things they are doing. Great. All right. I'll second that. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks. Thank we appreciate, appreciate it, Catherine. That. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. And keep up the great work. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Catherine. All right. Next up on our agenda, we've got our uh, regular COVID-19 state of emergency update. And hey, EMD. Hello, Lori. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you folks? Oh, pretty good. Good. So what, what, uh, what's going on this week? Well, the news isn't good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, on Friday, I was notified of one new positive case in Sunderland. Hmm. And this morning, I was notified of two new positive cases in Sunderland. So that's three in one week. Uh, Where does that move our yeah, yeah. percentages? It's going to move it. Yep. It's going to move it. Because there was one last week as well. So, no, is there that, wasn't. It was week before, sorry. Week before. Yep, week before. Does, does that put us back in the red or darker gray, I maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Yellow, maybe. Yellow, okay. Yellow, because right. we're heading up. Yep. yep. Oh, yeah. Doesn't it depend on how, if it's the number per 100,000, we probably would be, but if it's the less than five total over the last two weeks, then that's the definition of gray. So it's. Yeah. Depends on how you look at it. Yeah. I hate to say it's a gray area, but I have. <laughs> I was avoiding that. <laughs> I know. Definitely I know. a gray area. It's, it's, <laughs> Our sound man should be hitting the rim shot button. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep, for sure. Uh, and, you know, this, these positive cases may be as a result of better testing, more testing. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, and this was bound to happen. Well, and I, said, I, think, I think we all kind of expected as the winter and the autumn came along that we were going to see this spike no matter what. So, yes. Yeah. I think you're right. Uh, so we're talking with public health nurse and the contact tracing mechanism kicks in and all of the system is in place. Have there been any um, updates to the approach that the system takes or are we still using the same steps from June, July, August? We are still using the same steps from June, okay. July, August. I don't know what the steps have changed as far as UMass goes. Okay. okay. Um, because I don't know how she looks at her data. Mm -hmm. Jeff, has there been any follow-up since our Thursday, whatever it was, two weeks ago with UMass? Yeah, uh, I've spoken with the chair of the Board of Health and, and she and the public health nurse and um, the uh, university officials have, have been communicating and from what I gather have um, streamline those communications and at Good. least um, are, are able to follow up with each other. So I, I have not heard of any issues um, continuing. So I, I think that, that we have that straightened out. Good, um, good. You know, I, I think it's, as we heard, it's still a little bit, um, I'd say, a little bit delayed from when it gets entered into the UMass system to when it gets entered into Maven, and that's how we're notified. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the university is working on on doing that as quickly as possible because they understand uh, how important it is for us to know that so that we can do our contact tracing and, and let our residents know. Great. Great. Appreciate that. So I think, you know, if we all continue to pay attention and be diligent, you know, we, we can avoid a, a brutal winter, but it, it makes, it puts the onus on us collectively and individually to be smart. Those masks, those hand washings, those contact, you know, those contact circles, you know, that, that um, amount of spheres right. that touch each other during the course of a week and meeting your personal contacts, you know, be smart about that. 
nothing exactly. about. We don't, we don't, we don't want to overwhelm the healthcare system, and we certainly don't want anybody sicker than they need to be, ever. Yeah, and, and I realize that the challenge too, and you ro start rolling into the holiday season when you know this is a time where typically we're getting together in larger groups. We have to be a lot more cognizant of that this year, unfortunately. Absolutely so, right. yeah. Just before this yeah. meeting, we canceled our holiday parties at my family just because of the proximity of everybody's the kinds of work that we all do, and you know our parents, yep. and you know that's just the way it is. You put thirty of us in the same space from all of the different contacts we have, that's just a formula that we're, we're told to avoid for good reason. So that's the way it is. Did the same thing with my Thanksgiving. So yes. you know, done. I hear you. Right. It's going to be quiet. It's going to be my dream Christmas. <laughs> I mean, a lot, you said that out loud? <laughs> I, I said it to them too out loud. <laughs> uh, going to have a few extra turkey pot pies, I think, this year. There you go. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, is there anything that we've learned that might help us going into like what I'll say is round two, you know, um, of this, I guess maybe, you know, it, I don't mean, the processes, don't hold yeah. your breath for a vaccine. Don't yes. hold your breath for federal government help act, act responsibly and, and act locally. That's, yeah. that's what we learned. And, don't forget and, these. Yeah, and, exactly. And take stock of your PPE now. You know, I'll check in with the fire good, department, check in with the police department, point. Uh, DPW. But we, you know, we have to make sure they've got enough go to go through the winter because yep, right, it's bad. Yeah, when the run's on, you're absolutely right. You want to be out there, hat in hand, looking for it. You want to have it available. Yes, That's right. Great point. And and even if they came up with a vaccine next week, rollout time takes quite a while. So you know, we're still looking right. until you know. The, well into the winter so right yeah, yeah that's yeah. great points true well thanks for the i'll just say news laurie and <laughs> the, the poor update. messenger of that but yeah uh, i know <laughs> everything going that's okay otherwise though yes okay good yes good yes thanks so much emd appreciate it yep, yep. good to see you and then you too. jeff go ahead to jeff yeah i just wanted to note that in other COVID news, the governor issued three orders today and just to highlight a couple of them. Um, they go into effect 12.01 a.m. on Friday. Um, and, and the highlights are sort of, one is face coverings. Basically anytime anybody is over five, uh, anybody who is over five years old is out in public, um, they need to be wearing a face mask. Um, there's also a stay at home advisory for everybody from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, the exceptions being, you know, if you need to go to the hospital, if you need to go shopping for food, necessities, or if you need to work, were sort of the three examples that they gave. Um, a revised gatherings order, and, and the two big things from that are indoor gatherings are limited to 10 or fewer, uh, outdoor 25 or fewer, and uh, all gatherings regardless of location or size um, must end at 9.30 with all guests leaving. Uh, and then there was also an early closings and alcohol order um, which basically says that restaurants need to stop table service. Alcohol can't be sold or served uh, after 9.30 p.m. So all that goes into effect uh, at this Friday, basically. And there should be a link out on the website, the state website for all that information. Yeah. So folks can go out there and check on that if you're not sure about what the latest uh, changes are. Brilliant. Good. Stay vigilant. Pay attention. Always wise words to live by, especially now. Right. <clears throat> okay. Right. Any other um, COVID topics, Jeff and all, that you'd like to cover? Or? Uh, nope. All right. Great. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, EMD. See you. See you next week. See you next week. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Stay safe. That's right. Too. Uh, 
Um, so let's see, we've got, um, <clears throat> and our next topic is uh, our placeholder for employee wage adjustments in COLA. And other than what we got from our legislative update, we really don't have any new items on there. So <clears throat> more to come on that one. Um, and then we've got our regular select board and updates and town administrator updates. I don't know if you have anything tonight, Scott, at all. Actually, I had a message from the town clerk, David, about reminding people that tomorrow is, of course, election day. It's at the town library, which is a second time using this space. So people who pay attention, they got to go to the town library. It's from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, and there are spacing and mask requirements and it's uh, limited the number of people inside each of the spaces just because of the geometry. Uh, I think the town clerk and her team have worked really hard to make sure that that flow is right. And uh, we look forward to hearing any feedback uh, after the election about how that went. Yeah, um, that's important. Also, I would say this is anecdotally, but talking with the town clerk earlier, I'm sorry, late last week about the total number of um, early ballots uh, and mail-in ballots that have been received already. Uh, tomorrow might be a lot of tabulating. Uh, that's for sure, uh, for sure. But it sounds like um, a large majority of the town residents have taken advantage of the early and the uh, mail voting. So again, tomorrow, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the town library. Uh, be patient, be kind. Uh, and exercise kind of, your right to vote. It's kind of in line with the numbers we're seeing nationally too. It's sort of yeah. a similar pattern. So yep. that, that's, yeah. And I, I know, uh, you know, with, <clears throat> with all the elections out there, they always work very hard. And the, the people who are helping out at those polls aren't strange people trucked in from netherworlds. They're your neighbors and your friends and you know who they are. And so there's nothing new. We've done this for what, the last 200 years or so. So I think we can, probably hopefully find it within ourselves to pull another election out with the, without a lot of events. So, and, and like you said, Scott, get out there and exercise your right to vote. That's one of the foundations of our democracy. So, all right, Jeff, how's it going? Going well, um, <laughs> I guess two quick updates. Um, one is, uh, Rep. Blade mentioned the the river walk and the community pathways committee is actually going to be out there. I believe this Saturday at uh, nine thirty in the morning to um, put new stone dust down there. Nice. Um, and so if there's anybody who's looking for something to do on Saturday morning and wants to help <laughs> out, um, they they're meeting uh, along the river walk at nine thirty. Um, and could use a hand. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and then I'm beginning my uh, municipal finance seminar, which is going to be all day every Friday um, from now through December 11th, uh, except for the Friday after Thanksgiving. Um, so if, if I am less than responsive on those days <laughs> um it, it's not because i don't care I'm because learning. you'll be in deeply engrossed in state finance so that'll be that'll be excellent exactly and i guess on, on a similar topic um i the uh the procurement i think i i believe i became eligible for an associate procurement officer for supplies and services. So I applied for that official designation. I did pass the supplies and services contracting portion. Um, I think the only thing, the only reason I'm, I'd be an associate is because I don't have three years of procurement experience. Got it. Um, so yes. Well, congrats, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Do you get a special hat with that or? Uh, we, T-shirt. There was a big party, about 500 nice. people. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah. All in a small space. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I got a nice certificate. It was very Excellent. There you go. You didn't get your make procurement great again shirt there? It's a good time. 
that's uh, that's that's good though. It's very valuable. It's it's a really it's a, actually an interesting topic. There's a you know a lot to lot to take in there. So, I think it's important to bear in mind, Mr. Chair, that's a commitment that the town made as part of the hiring with Jeff. That's true. Right. And Jeff, you know, we collectively lose. We can collectively lose sight of the fact that. You know, when when we uh, uh, hired Jeff, that there was contingent on a handful of thresholds that needed to be made, and he's come through with each of those thresholds. So I thank him for that, uh, mm -hmm. as well as to the town staff who's allowed the latitude to do that. Agree. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next up is we, I see we have a mass DOT village center committee letter. I moved to send that letter. I read it earlier tonight. Yes. That was the one Lauren and uh, Jeff worked on as a byproduct of the village center committee meeting a week and a half ago. Yep. And it basically reminds, um, the mass DOT, the importance of, uh, communicating with the town, the importance that we're placing on the impact any kind of any kind of road work intersection work has in that village center and i think also if i'm not mistaken the charge of the committee is attached as well so it's not just something that was made up or spontaneous as a part of the dialogue a couple of three weeks ago with mass dot which frankly was i, I thought very very helpful i was but just gonna say yeah you know, we, the phone hasn't been ringing off the hook about, you know, why are they going to do something that we don't quite know of? I like the fact that it's available online, uh, but also the, they were consistent in their position that this is very preliminary, not even 25%. And when I hear that 25% design mark, you know, I, I know what the town has gone through on the decade we've been working on North Main Street, right? You know, because you look at it, you think, oh, it's only 25%, but there's a whole lot of footwork that has gone into that. Exactly right. It's so they're pre-25%, which means it's it's very conceptual. Yeah, yeah I thought it was very good, too. And, yep. and I, I, yeah, that was, that was a very important point to make was the early stages of that process and their receptiveness to feedback and information. So. Right. So as you talk to people, you see them at the corner store or talk to your neighbors, remind them that far from a done deal and there's plenty of opportunity for input, which this letter is reinforcing. We want to be able to have some of that input. We want to be a uh, you know, working partner uh, with DOT on any, whether it's rotary or line striping, we don't care, um, any improvements in the center of town. So move to sign and send. All right. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, two to zero on that one. <clears throat> um, next up, we reach the uh, in public comment section, just in case anybody has any general public comments. All right. <clears throat> and with that, <clears throat> as Scott mentioned earlier, I'll just remind folks that tomorrow is election day, so Please get out and vote. <clears throat> and our next meeting is going to be Monday, November 9th, 2020, at our usual time. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's probably about it, unless uh, anybody has anything else they want to wrap up with. I think that's, that's probably it. If that's uh, not hearing any, I'll make a motion to adjourn. All right. All those in favor? And I'll second. Aye. Aye. All so right. you can tell Tom we beat it. We got under uh, an hour. I, you know, this is a remarkably short one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will tell him we were saving him for when he wasn't here. <laughs> exactly. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you next week.